You know, uh, adapting to the pandemic this past year has involved adapting. The Abiders, a sassy blues band out Minnetonka Way, and QCTV, a lively community TV station in the northern burbs, have been working through it. And what we did learn was this. This is Democratic Visions. Here's producer Jeff Strait. And later, we'll consider a heated and emotional controversy in my town, Eden Prairie. All those in favor, say aye. aye. With a May 4th City Council vote, new homes could be shoehorned into Eden Prairie's ever-shrinking blufflands. We need them to tell us. We need a real study done. Not these fragmented studies. These things are minuscule. They're taking It was April 29th, the sky was blue, and the bays and coves of Lake Minnetonka were dancing in the breeze and lifting our spirits. I figured it was time to visit the KNJ Surf Shop and Mound. It's just a few feet from the beautiful shore of our inland sea. Carl and Julie Weisenhorn and Zola, uh, their best friend, were walking onto the surf shop's deck when I arrived. A big old check. I rip it up, said, baby, wrap your arms. We know one another. They're the heart of my favorite blues band, The Abiders. Top shelf artists, loose and, and bursting with fun. I feel like I'm in heaven. Yeah, the abiders. If it ain't fun, they ain't doing it. The six feet apart rule closed the microbreweries and big venues they played be before the pandemic. Like the rest of us, they've been hibernating. But the sun was shining and we were feeling good again. So this is the big room, and this is kind of the hub of all the music that we do. We yeah. have lots of memorabilia. I time. gotta level with you. The surf shop is actually their recording studio. Carl, or Carlos if you prefer, he doesn't care. And Julie showed me the studio, which also is a place where they rehearse, create, and have a lot of fun. What have the abiders been doing during the COVID uh, protocols? We unfortunately haven't been able to play together, so we haven't done any gigs, we haven't been rehearsing, and we haven't really even seen each other for quite a while. But we have uh, done a number of Facebook videos and posted those out, which have been kind of fun, and gotten good response from our viewers and listeners. And then we've been writing songs. We're working on a new album, uh, tentatively titled The Green Album by my brother Scott, who's playing bass on it. And uh, we'll see what happens. So we're kind of just, just kind of working on it and having fun. And the, the new songs really are the, the outcome of Julie's mind, heart, and soul because she's had these songs in her for a long time. And now that we have not been, quote, distracted with real gigs, I think she's been free to use this room to let her stuff come out, and it's really, I'm really proud of her. I think it's important to know that the reason I got Julie this first guitar is while she played piano, we sang in a, in a cover rock band, and she wanted to write music. And the only way to write music really was to start with a guitar. So, I got her a good guitar to start with, and the rest is kind of history. She stayed with it ever since, and look what's happened. You know how many guitars a person needs? <laughs> One more. And harmonicas? Mm, not necessarily. I'm going down to the river, gonna sit on the ground. I'm going down to the river. Is 
that Carl is much fun during the COVID era as he is on stage when things were normal? Carl's been doing great. Carl retired in September. He's been doing wonderfully. He finished a bathroom. <laughs> we finally redid a bathroom. And he's uh, gone out to my cousin Steve's farm and helped fix the combine, which he's never even seen a combine before. And we did some uh, traveling around up north, uh, visiting family. But he's been really busy helping people. So he's been kind of the, the nice guy in the neighborhood. But my to-do list, I, everybody said, what are you going to do when you're retired? You're so busy and traveling. I'm on page seven of my to-do yeah. list. And every time I check one off, three more show up. So, so how many pages are there now? <laughs> There's seven that maybe I just looked at them this morning and went, I have to flip a page, I ran out of room again. The Abiders were formed a decade ago after Carlos and Julie met Doug Moland in Excelsior. Andy D and other crazy good musicians joined the band. And uh, who among us would have figured that Carlos, as Carl, had a career in graphics, imaging, and technical management? Uh, Julie Weisenhorn has also led a double life. She's a University of Minnesota Extension educator and one of its specialists on WCCO Radio's The Smart Garden Show, hosted by Denny Law. Julie Weisenhorn from the University of Minnesota. Good morning, Julie. Hey, Denny. How you doing this morning? I, I'm doing really well, and uh, I feel really I myself am a Saturday morning listener. Way down, Way down. Columbus Starhawking, my friends all turned back on me. Do you miss the live performances? I miss seeing everybody. I miss seeing our friends and the people who come to hear us. I kind of enjoyed not having live performances just because it's awfully, I find it quite stressful and uh, I never really know how it's going to turn out. Carl, on the other hand, loves live performances, so we're kind of the yin and yang of that. <laughs> well, the thing about live performances is it's the the outcome of your practice, of your hard work, and for me, I'm in charge of sound. So getting everything together in every room and every place has a different, as you know, kind of sound response. When that all pulls off and we get done with that second song and we all hear each other and are playing, I tell you, it's, it's as good as it gets with your clothes on. That's your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank the Lake Minnetonka Cable Commission production team for their mighty fine sound check footage that was made in Mound a couple of years ago. LMCC serves the Lake Minnetonka area. It has a website, of course, and streams great local programming. Check them out. Another innovative community TV station is serving the residents of Andover, Anoka, Champlin, and Ramsey. Quad Cities Television, or QCTV, has been recognized nationally for its crisp, hyper-local productions. With growing competition from social media, the streaming of everything to anything with the screen, declining cable subscribers, and most especially the pandemic, I wanted to know how QCTV is faring. Even though there has been subscriber shed because there are more choices in that market area. Uh, this spring, I twice visited with Karen George at QCTV's facility in Champlin. Uh, we still see a lot of traditional cable subscribers, so I'm still a little bullish on cable TV. Karen is the executive director of the Quad Cities Cable Communications Commission, the agency that oversees QCTV for its four member cities. QCTV has been very nimble in response to uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic. Uh, it was just a little over a year ago where essentially the world stopped uh, and people were asked to stay home and 
We did not stop services here at QCTV. We did not stay home. We continued uh, safely to come into the office, uh, wear masks, social distance. Uh, we changed around our whole studio configuration and, uh, and our mobile production van configuration so that we could continue to bring uh, local uh, news and information and events to our public. Thing on? Can you hear me? Hey guys, Corey from QCTV here. How's it going? Um, so I really give a lot of credit to staff for making that work and being very viable and nimble and flexible in the pandemic. An example of some of the programs we produced would be um, our local Youth First. You know, they do a big mayor's prayer breakfast, which is their largest fundraiser. So we reached out to them and said, how can we help you deliver that in a virtual environment? Uh, and, and we did. They came into our studio, they were socially distanced, uh, and there were just two people, and we had one person running the camera and one person recording. We sent it out live over our channels, over our website, and over social media channels. It was a quick 20-minute program, and I think in those 20 minutes, they raised over $14,000. We've, we've done some other very creative things. One was to, uh, this was within the first 10 days of the pandemic and the shutdown. Uh, entertainment venues were shut down. And so we had a connection with Mick Sterling, who is um, an old rocker from the area. And he has a organization called the 30 Days Foundation, which benefits people in need. So we figured out how to uh, get a signal into musicians' homes. Uh, they performed live, we did a two hour special every Saturday night for six weeks, uh, bringing uh, people from uh, you know kitchen tables and garages and basements and bedrooms and living rooms uh, to create music in a live format for people to watch at home and then be able to donate directly to that musician through Mix 30 Days Foundation. And in six weeks, again, there was over $10,000 raised that went directly to musicians in our local area. The other kind of bread and butter part of QCTV is delivering live government meetings. So you start looking at live government meetings and you couldn't have, you know, five, six, seven people sitting at a dais very close together conducting important local city business. Uh, watching from home today, obviously this is a unique situation uh, in that um, the rest of the council is at, uh, in their homes this evening. Um, attending remotely. Uh, QCTV had been in process of creating remote meeting participation with different technology. In fact, one of our cities was already installed with remote meeting and two more cities came online very quickly. Uh, so again, staff working with creative city staff to say, how do we make this work? Uh, and so we all learned about Zoom. <laughs> we all learned about go-to meetings and um, we're still doing it today. Here. Commissioner Cook. Here. Commissioner Nemec. Other local community cable stations and the school districts and cities they serve are adapting to new media, hastened, of course, by COVID-19 restrictions. Right now we're streaming live a lot of our, our events and high school sports to our Facebook page. We're also sharing those feeds uh, with um, the actual organization that we're covering so they can put it on their Facebook and reach a wider audience. And I think that's the beauty of local programming um, as we see it here at QCTV, is really expanding our reach to where people are consuming their information and entertainment. Uh, it's not just on a cable channel, it's not just on a broadcast channel. There are so many more technology ways to view that. May is National Hamburger Month, so to celebrate Andy's Diner. Uh, if anything, you have seen back. more and more screens come into people's lives. I mean, for goodness sake, I go to the gas station and now there's a screen of people talking at me as I pump my gas. People are getting more discerning how they spend their screen time. And I think what we've learned in, in the pandemic world is people are really engaged in their local communities. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary in this community serving the, the cities of Andover, Anoka, Champlin, and Ramsey. You know, I should add that Democratic Visions is carried by QCTV. Riley Creek in Eden Prairie curls past a fountain tap of cold artesian water. They're nested in bluff lands edging the Minnesota Valley. 
The flow from the pipe originates from a spring hidden from public view a bit to the west. It never stops. Neither do those who come for drinking and cooking water. I come from Shakopee to, to come to the well, and I've been coming here for many, many years. It tastes fresh and, you know, it has no after, aftertaste, and it's just, it's cold and pure and clear, and I love it better than city water. Some forgotten panel of well-meaning officials named the spring after previous owners a Mr. Frederick and a, a Mr. Miller. Uh, they don't sound like Lakota names. Everyone has a right to be here, to pass through here, and to have... On May 4th, folks from around the region who appreciate the spring joined like-minded Eden Prairians. The city council was holding a public hearing on a development proposal for 50 expensive new homes above and near the creek and the spring tap. Now, Pulte Homes, a major national builder, will buy 28 acres from the owner, the Standall family, if the city approves their project. Nearly a third of the property, the park close to Riley Creek and the public tap, would be deeded to the city probably for park purposes. The, the geography of the land is concerning that someone would want to develop it. It's about the community's love for this general area. Rebecca Prochaska and Sue Bennett live nearby what is being branded as Noble Hill. They are not neighbors, but the Noble Hill proposal brought them together. Sue Bennett. I have lived in Eden Prairie for over 30 years. My children grew up uh, through the school system and I became aware of um, the development that's going up around the Miller Spring area and that they were going to put 50 $700,000 homes up on the hill that's adjacent to Miller Spring and I just felt like I needed to do something and became just a really concerned citizen. My part in this started out really small. We posted on the Nextdoor website about the facts and the figures about 50 homes coming in this area and the outcry from the local residents was amazing. And then uh, it started with us wanting to do a very business professional approach where we started doing research and collecting data to support our concerns. Rebecca Prochaska. Uh, we know that the Riley Creek watershed is already in an impaired state per the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, impaired for aquatic recreation or life and that's because of the existing development that is here today. The watershed in this community is already polluted. Why are we building 50 more houses on top of that? Rebecca and Sue identified with the quickly formed Friends of Frederick Miller Spring. Hey everybody, I'm here at Frederick Miller Spring in Eden Prairie. You can see here. Uh, members of the group launched a website, a Facebook group, and a GoFundMe campaign. The spring tap became a venue for more than just the water. And it worked. More than 3,200 folks would sign a petition by May Day. And a torrent of emails and phone calls were sent to city officials. One of the most important things that we have found is that the spring is only tested on a monthly basis for bacteria. And we were looking in our research, and in 2011, a private water company came in and did a full test. And that was the last time it was completely tested and they did find contaminants, slight, slight amounts of nitrates, and probably from lawn fertilizer. Friends of the Spring had doubts about the data, which the city and developer argued showed that the project would not harm the creek or spring. Uh, Rebecca Pro. Jessica? When the Eden Prairie Planning Commission considered the Noble Hill project on March 22, Rebecca, Sue, and the friends were ready for the public hearing. So too were the Pulte Homes agent and the city planning staff. The request to rezone to R195 is consistent with the city's 2040 comprehensive plan. Eden Prairie's 2040 guide plan is a, a flexible policy directive, one that welcomes consideration of developing an old tree farm on the side of a bluff 
or returning it to Mother Nature. In different ways, both are expensive options, but one of them can never be reversed. Let's work together to preserve the city's remaining prairie lands and woodlands for future generations. Thank you. That together, we have a beautiful opportunity to maintain this forest, this contiguous habitat. Um, if you believe that the road salts, pesticides, and fertilizers from any new development put above the creek and the, and the spring will not affect the water quality in the spring, then I've got a double-decker outhouse that I think you're going to love. Um, Commissioner Farr, I really appreciated your questioning around kind of describing what the process looks like when you're... The public hearing the lasted two hours and eight minutes. Without enthusiasm and a mixed vote, the commission sent the proposal on to the city council. The friends still had their doubts. Sue Bennett. And one of the big things that was right out there was is they're using a report, the EAW, from 2007 uh, as their basis for a lot of their decisions. And it just that environmental like assessment worksheet, or EAW, had little to do with the spring or creek. The friends sent off a special petition to the state agency that manages the EAW process. The Environmental Quality Board agreed with the Friends. Some of the Friends came to realize that the city, as diligent as it is, had been too focused on the spring as if it was the only turning point. The City Council is making this about one issue. They keep talking about the water coming out of the spigot, but there's a huge effect down to Riley Creek and the watershed that comes down to, to Riley Creek. Overall, we thought we were following a fair process where 3,200 petition signatures had a voice. We thought that we were being good creative thinkers when we offered to do fundraising to acquire the land and, per and to acquire the land and convert it to a conservation area. We've also con uh, Sue Bennett was like among Senator some Sullivan. 60 testifiers during the May 4th Paradise. City Council see, hearing. They so wanted a better to deal to for the people of Eden Prairie. The EAW that was used in that, from everything we could tell, was the EAW from the road, which was not supposed to be used in that way. I've been drinking at the spring for 12 years. It's my only living water source. That's, well, it's the only living water source actually in the whole Twin Cities area. You know the history of the bluff. You know how unstable. You know how unstable it is. You've heard from Calvin Alexander, one of the best professors at the University of Minnesota. Listen to him. Listen to him. It is not surprising to me that they would choose a company like Pulte Homes to reimagine their beloved property for the benefit of the community and the environment. And now 456 irreplaceable trees in the beautiful area of Riley Creek will be removed for another development. Why is this a good idea to break ground on what you have clearly heard from other people? Like, what's the incentive for you? 50 homes, maybe? I'm in favor of this project. I think it would improve the water in that creek, possibly, hopefully. That's the goal of everyone here. I'm also hearing a lot of really imaginative solutions for how we can be conserving that land. And I, I, I do want to add one clarifying comment when I get quoted. Um, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that it gets developed. It's a foregone conclusion that it will get sold. So, um, go the friends had hoped that their successful petition to the State Environmental Quality Board for further study would be honored by the city. And they also wanted the Standall property to remain zoned as rural. And most wanted the Standalls to get their money as soon as possible. The catch was the city council members uh, did not agree with the EAW and zoning requests. Uh, I moved to adopt the resolution denying citizen petition for preparation for a EAW. Adopt a At around midnight, it EAW voted five zip to give its preliminary five. approval five. to the Pulte plan. Passes unanimously. Regardless, it's never over until it's over. Sue Higgins and Rebecca Prochaska spoke with me the Saturday following the city council vote. 
So we are going to appeal the EAW and the rezoning with the City of Eden Prairie. Some of the things we're concerned about that were left out, a, a big one was the cumulative effects of the existing development surrounding this resource. This was a, a group of people such as ourselves that filed the EAW and also just residents who were very, very concerned about the situation. In spite of pushback from a few letter writers and the, the council vote, I appreciate that the friends say that they'll keep fighting. Well, I've got to be transparent with you. I do have a history with the Artesian Springs and Seeps along Riley Creek. Prospect Road crosses Riley Creek a, a bit west of the spring. This is what it looked like on May 8th. And this is what it looked like 15 years ago this summer. My friend Doug Schmidt and my then young son Alex Here. were taking Riley's temperature See, and looking for possible high. trout yeah. holes. I think those are like trout eggs. We waited Riley from Eden Prairie Road to Spring Road. You see, at that time, folks living in Hennepin Village had organized against the Prospect Road crossing. You know, there were springs there too. Uh, we figured we might be able to help by finding some of those springs and uh, taking temperatures. For a while, the Cedar Hills Golf and Ski Area that used to be here kept a trout pond along the creek. But the trout and the rope toes and the fairways are, are long gone. And this reach of the creek now flows through a culvert underneath Prospect Road. About 50 and a half degrees. Homes now edge the bluff tops along the creek, but the seeps that supply the spring water are located within the Prairie Bluffs Conservation Area. Eden Prairie currently has 43 miles of nature trails. We have 1,400 acres of natural areas, but we have put that together over the last 30 to 40 years. We own the largest old growth virgin wood stand in all the seven county metro areas. Here in Eden Prairie, walk the trails, it's the big woods. The Richard T. Anderson, we own more bluff land than any other city up and down our neighbors with, with the Minnesota River. Folks should realize that many of EP's parks and open spaces were created or enlarged through negotiations with developers of private property. The Pulte Homes plan would send nearly a third of the standall spread to the city after some restoration work. Uh, okay, but I ask myself, what do satellite images say about Eden Prairie's bluff lands these days? From Highway 169 to Eden Prairie Road, we've got a, uh, a parade of palaces on our bluffs, our signature landscapes. We're called Eden Prairie. Even Hennepin Village could have been set back some. We understand that in the vicinity there are, there's an evening primrose, that's a species of special concern, as well as the kittentail, which is a threatened species. This may be a prime habitat for the rusty patch bumblebee, so we're looking into that as well. Even though we understand that the new development might not have a direct effect on the spring, it will definitely have an effect on one of the nation's most important migratory flyways. Here's one option that we're that we're that we'd like to see considered is joining this unique land with with what's already protected right next door, which is the Prairie Bluff Conservation Area. There is high merit in acquiring all or most of the standall land for protection and restoration. The old Christmas tree farm connects areas of importance to both Mother Nature and the Eden Prairie community. This will be difficult, but partnering with state, regional, federal, and private funding opportunities can make it happen. Thanks for staying with us. Remember, be active and, and smile some. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. 
Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.